years when I was a very young nurse and did lots of other things in between and then came back to Hospice Missoula and I've been there a little over three. Um, Cindy Peters is also a hospice nurse. She's worked with Hospice in Missoula. Has been there a little over two years. Not quite two. Not quite two years. Um, and that's her first experience with hospice. First hospice. And it fits like a club. She's really good at what she does. And Wow, Penny, I don't know much about you except for that I like you and you're a hospice nurse. <laughs> yeah. So Penny's a hospice nurse, works for Rocky Mountain Hospice here in Missoula, but came from you. I am, okay. You won't hold it against Diana. I can't. I, can't. I, can't. I did a year in you. Did I worked a year in you, but I'm really from Atlanta, Georgia, and Miami, Florida. Um, started in labor and delivery and came full circle into hospice via my dad's own passing at my home with hospice. And so started with a startup in Atlanta that grew from two patients to over 200 in a year and somehow found myself in Piedmont Montana for a year. At the M&M. Yeah, and so here I am. No, I'm so glad you came. Thank you. So I know that Penny has to leave early, so we'll let you start and we'll just go the other way. Okay. Not that you can leave right now, but I'm just saying. Thank you. I have five minutes. I'm so sorry. Go, go. So I think that um, for me, I think it would be nice if you were willing to talk a little bit about what hospice nursing means to you, and then to share like a unique story about that. I feel like I'm in a job interview. Okay. I know. <laughs> um, started. And the time starts. Well, okay. Let me preface this. Started in labor and delivery. Um, loved it. Never thought I'd replace it with anything. I think the moment of birth is so similar 
as I'm sure you'll attest to, the moment of death. It's just such a spiritual feeling. I think unless you have experienced it, you probably you can't even ex- go there unless you've been at the moment of birth and the moment of death. And it's such a beautiful full circle type of experience to really be embedded with someone's most vulnerable time of their life, whether it be not only the patient, but also the family. So um, pretty much that's my love of it, is entrenching myself not only with the patient, but also with the families. And um, I would say my, I don't, I can't really come up with a favorite experience. Memorable. Bad. Okay. <laughs> Since I've been here, sure. Um, it was interesting for me. This was a startup here. Coming to Missoula was a startup. Had to pass a survey, so found myself as director of patient services doing marketing, all the admissions, all the call, passing the survey. Um, but still having the opportunity to be engaged in families' lives. And almost everywhere I go in this town, even though we've probably only crossed maybe a total of, I don't know, 100 families, I still always run into somebody that I have been a part of their life at that vulnerable time. And I don't think there would be another opportunity to be so engaged in somebody's vulnerable time like that. I'll run into them no matter where I go. I don't know if it's like I have a generic face or what, but they'll come up to me and then we'll start talking. It's like, oh my gosh, yes, I was actually a part of that. So that's really important to me. It is kind of interesting how, I'll bet you guys find the same thing, how we hear, well, I hope I never see you again. I mean, I don't mean it like that. You know, like they don't mean to say it like in a bad way, but. It's kind of like you don't want to see the guys from the IRS or your dentist again. You know, they're nice guys, but it's been an intense time and, you know, they yes. hope they don't see you again in that way. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. a blessing. It really is a blessing to be that they open their raw emotions and you're there at that time with them. And it's the same with the birth of a baby, I think. So that's been interesting. What was the worst situation you ever had? And how did you deal with that appropriately? Um, two deaths at the same time and tried to handle it myself and not deal with that. So yeah. 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 that's a tough yeah. one. It's not a hard one. Yeah. How about work out so good? Right. Hard. So just a blessing. And um, I don't know. I love Mindy knows. I love marketing too. I like educational opportunities to educate the community on really the services that hospice can bring and it still amazes me that families still don't get it and still don't understand that it's a benefit that they have earned the right to have in their lifetime and I just had a patient I admitted over at Grizzly Peak and every other word was how much does it cost? (laughs) It's free! yes, you earned the right to have this through all the years of service. And so I think that's a beautiful thing that, you know, we have a gift that we can share if we just get the message out there. And I think if we all collaborate, you know, I love hearing Aspen Hospice or Hospice of Missoula or partners or whatever because it should be real collaborative and boundaryless. And I think that you all do an awesome job with, you know, you have always, you know, the first week I was in Mozilla, Josh was over there, I don't know how many times, introducing himself and wanting to collaborate on educational pieces together. So I think that's important. Mm-hmm. And you have done a good job with that. So we'll miss him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that a uh, foundation for hospice is really that it's a spiritual event medical implications which sometimes get turns people upside down do you have any experiences that you think remind you of that? I think for me when my neighbor who started this amazing hospice company in Atlanta which is huge now um, he said to me well Penny you know you've been out of nursing for 17 years I stayed home with my children he was like but if you have the ABC's of you know 
being a human being, basically, you can be a great hospice nurse. And I was like, okay, what is that? Availability, bedside manner, and compassion. It's not so clinically driven as it is, um, you know, spiritually or emotionally or compassion-wise. And I don't, you know, I don't market myself as being highly clinical. I would have to say I'm more on the other end of the spectrum, and that's why I sort of think very well. So, okay. Yes. Is availability emotional? Is that what you meant by that? Well, I always, I'm just going to admit this, go la 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 la, but I don't have good boundaries, I will admit that. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> Probably I just got written up by somebody in this room. <laughs> I, I think availability would, you know, you could twist that to say not mm -hmm. only with your time and your cell phone number and all those other things, but availability as far as how deep do you really want to entrench yourself with this family. And for me, this is the last chapter of a family and, you know, you want them to be able to look back on this period of time with you know, that would, there's nothing I would have done different. There's nothing I would have changed. It was a beautiful experience. And, you know, the gift for me is having the um, avenue to make that happen for them, no matter what it is. You know, I know Tanya over at the village interviewed us, and at that point she was like, you know, I like to think of us as, you know, the Ritz of, um, skilled nursing care, and I was like, define that. And she's like, well, if your mother tells me that she wants a cup of hot tea at four o'clock in the afternoon, I'm gonna make that happen. As a hospice nurse for me, you know, if you come to me and you tell me I want this, that, and this, I'm gonna find a way to say yes to that or find a way to make that happen. So I think that was a good answer for that. I'm sure everybody in here agreed to that. And I, I wouldn't want a hospice nurse for my loved one that didn't feel that way. So, write me up. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Cindy will completely disagree with that, I'm sure. <laughs> will you? No, I'm no. Being sarcastic. She's being sarcastic. very sarcastic. Because there are two different perspectives on that. No, not me. And yeah, that's good. Cindy and I get it. Yeah. I've been a call nurse. I've been a director of patient services, I have been a continuous care nurse, I've been an admission nurse, um, I've been a case manager, I have been a marketer, so, and I have passed a survey without any kind of you know, issues, so I feel like I kind of get it, <laughs> but it changes every single day, so. Thank you. Yeah. So Cindy, you now you're on the hot seat. Cindy. Oh. Love it. <laughs> Spill your beans. <laughs> well, I never thought I would be a hospice nurse, and I, it's only been almost just coming up on two years. Mm -hmm. um, but I, too, worked in re reproductive health care, pregnancy, and um, actually women's rights, um, and family practice for my whole nursing career. And I'm from Missoula. I grew up here. And I had moved away to Charleston, and I had a, um, a unexpected death in my family, and it made me realize that I wanted to come home. And I happened to come to Missoula for my sister's memorial, and I had a job interview with Marika. And um, so I ended up moving back, which it, it's just, it, it is very similar to attending a woman through childbirth and also through um, the ending of a pregnancy with a termination. Um, there's a lot of grief involved in that and so it fit really perfectly with my experience in that regard. Um, I too have trouble with boundaries and in particular because I grew up here uh, I almost never have a client that I don't have some kind of connection to. Um, and so that sometimes can be tricky. Mm -hmm. But um, I, that's, that's how I roll. <laughs> I've gotten in trouble a couple of times for, for that. Um, and you know, so I guess, you know, in sort of the, in the spectrum of, 
you know, experience of nursing and uh, in, in particular with regard to hospice nursing, I'm still practicing and I'm, you know, I had this um, client recently who spoke of the medical community as practicing medicine and he would laugh so hard when he would say that. <laughs> well, they're just practicing medicine, right? They don't really know, do they? And in fact, he ended up graduating off of hospice because he did actually get better. Um, when he was told he had two weeks to live. And so, um, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm practicing. Each situation is completely different. You go into a home, wherever that home is, um, with whatever family they have, and I find myself mostly sitting on the floor. I hardly ever sit on chairs or anything like that. I'm tall, and I don't like standing over people. And I make myself comfortable on the floor, and I just try and figure out what that patient needs, what the family needs, um, how I can best support them. Because in reality, when we are doing hospice care, we are really just guiding families to do the work. Um, I've been told so many times, thank you so much, I couldn't have done this without you. And I didn't do the work, they did the work. Um, and so we're just there to help them figure it out and support yeah. them. Absolutely. So, and it's amazingly rewarding work. I get misty when I talk about it. <laughs> and, and there again, I cross boundaries. I cry almost every day. And I laugh really hard every day <laughs> with my awesome. peace. So, yeah. Crying and laughing every day. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sure, yeah, I think right? that's an interesting thing. You know, I feel like medicine started out as a community effort. I mean, it yeah. really was taking care of your neighbors yeah. and the farmer, yeah. getting someone, a doctor on horseback, you know, and I think that yeah. that has changed a lot due to lawsuits and regulations and, like, you know, all those things that we all know about. And to me, a hospice is the closest thing to that route of right, exactly. medical care in the home as a community and not. As a sterile environment, so mm -hmm. I celebrate that with you too. So, mm -hmm. it's lovely work. <clears throat> it makes the lines a little blurrier. Yeah. There's no choice around it. It's all you. Okay. Um, so I guess when I um, saw this beautiful flyer that Marika produced for this evening, what it said was. Um, what do hospice nurses know? <laughs> and so I kind of had to think back on that. And I guess what I'd like to impart to you is that <clears throat> I think hospice nurses know that um, they can't care for a family or a patient by themselves. So we have this team of people that um, enter into a family and a patient situation. And we work so closely together that it is seamless in terms of um, needs being met. And I think Penny said it really well. You know, you want, you want things to go perfectly for patients, but, you know, mostly people aren't perfect, and mostly families aren't either. And so it takes sometimes a lot of creativity and a lot of brainstorming to make things go as well as they should and can possibly go. And I appreciate that. And so I like community to know that, that it's not just about the nurses. Um, Secondarily, because I have quite a long background in, in education, um, that I know that people do well or better in any situation if they're just a little bit prepared. And um, usually at end of life, people don't have a lot of energy um, dedicated um, to doing their own research and um, figuring out things for themselves. And so they're looking for somebody to coach, just to coach a little bit and to support them to do what they want to do um, for their family member or their friend or whoever it might be um, that uh, is in that end of life situation. And so we can come in and um, add what we know and we don't have to tell them everything we know because some people need a little bit and some people need a whole lot. But one of the things that I found in most situations is that um, there's this huge word called forgiveness. And in almost every situation that I encounter, um, there's some forgiveness that needs to happen before things are complete. 
And it can be small stuff or it can be big stuff. And, and hospice um, teams have an uncanny ability to help patients and their families navigate that so that some things are said that might not otherwise be said um, before a person ends up leaving this world. And um, that can mean the difference between um, a peaceful passing, remembrances of what might have been called a, a good death or a peaceful death versus something that maybe is more traumatic and um, for a family um, uh, maybe kind of tearing members apart. Um, so I think that word forgiveness um, leads me to think about um, the experience in my hospice career that I will never forget. And um, it revolves around a Native American family. And um, I was living in a, in a small town called Ponca City, Oklahoma. Worked for a hospice that was very rural and very small and started by a pastor and a nurse in the community. And um, um, that became my introduction to the fact that every tribe um, operates differently and they have a different amount of assets that are distributed. And so I encountered one of the, what I'm sure is the poorest um, tribe in the nation, um, uh, the Ponkin Indians, and worked a little bit on that reservation and then also the people that were in town that had managed maybe to find employment and, and be off for a while. So um, it's a story that revolves around a woman who had a diagnosis that I can't even remember. It was a terrible disease that um, uh, made her um, extremely rigid. And she could talk, but she could not move any part of her body. <clears throat> so by the time I met her, she was just taking a little bit of water. And I ended up, though, caring for her for nearly a month. Um, she had a ninth grade son. Um, who was what they call a fancy dancer, and a husband. The family was intact in the home. And the night before she died, she um, asked me to call, um, I'll change his name for you, Paul, into the house so that she could talk to him. And this young man had just finished an evening out. He walked in dressed in his regal black velvet and feathers and stood there before us, and she asked him to sit down. And when he did, she looked at him and said, I forgive you. If you have taken money from my purse, I forgive you. If you have lied to me, I forgive you. And they were small things, but she knew that this child needed to hear this before she went on. And um, she died the next morning. And I thought, um, what a brilliant woman she was to have known that that forgiveness needed to be given to that young man, who, like every ninth grader, will push his limits. Um, but he didn't have the time to gift what he would become to his mom. So that's my story. That's my story. <laughs> what a great story. Yeah. Your turn. Uh, I have to follow you. Yeah. <laughs> it's just getting it harder and harder. Yeah. Well, I too um, wanted to come back to your your brochure, your your idea, of what hospice nurses know, and my answer to that is only one thing: that we will all die. <laughs> That's all I know. Right. I I I can say that. It, in my years of, of taking care of patients at end of life, I have noticed patterns. I have noticed um, similarities, a, a, a process. Um, as, as Penny and Cindy said, is similar to birthing, dying is not an event. It's a process, and they're, they're similar. It's like a labor. Um, but as as everyone has already said, each individual death is as individual as the person who is dying and as individual as the family and friends, the support network around that person. So there is no, I, I guess what I know is there's no right or wrong. There's no set, pat, set 
exactly. rules uh, that we have to do. We, what we do is, I think, observe and try to remain non non-judgmental. Um, if we can remain as non-judgmental as possible, just observe, we can try to figure out ways to guide that person and their support system, the family, the friends, whoever they are. Even if the, if the patient is in a facility that includes the staff, um, whoever is around them involved, sometimes People are in other states or countries, and we, we work on the phone with those people to, to provide support. But if we just kind of have to, a huge part of our job is observation. And in that observation, we learn every single day. And it's just it's a, an ongoing process of learning. And I feel really, really grateful to be in this profession because I have learned so much, and I will learn much, much more as, <laughs> as I continue on. But um, I feel very, very fortunate and blessed that I have this opportunity because it is probably the most one of. I, I'm not an. I never was an L and D nurse or labor and delivery, <laughs> so I've only experienced the birth of my own children. But but I do know that dying is one of the most intimate processes times of our lives and to be part of that is is amazing um, I in in talking about a, a case or a, an event or a death a death that stands out to me I'd actually like to talk about two that were similar and one is appropriate this week because everybody's I'm sure aware of the ALS ice bucket challenge mm -hmm. well I did have a patient with hospice in Missoula who died of ALS and it happened on my call weekend, so I was the, the only nurse um, with this woman while she passed away. And, and it, it was sad because she had arranged to have an assisted, um, a physician assisted suicide. She had arranged to have uh, the drugs delivered to her and she was planning to drink this cocktail to end her own life. And the drugs hadn't arrived yet. Um, they were coming from another state. And the weekend that I was on call, she called frantically Friday night, and she had lost the ability to swallow. So she wouldn't be able to do this. And she was frantic. And I spent the weekend with this family. Fortunately, I did not have another family that needed me that weekend because they took up it would have been tough being the only nurse. Somebody mentioned having to care for two patients at once, or two deaths at once. That's, that's very difficult. You can't do it. You need to call in help. But um, this, we, we were able to work with this woman, and with the, the, the entire family was around. They were very, very supportive of what she had planned to do. So they, all, they were all there, and they all wanted her to just be comfortable. And we got her comfortable, and she died in the matter of two days. She was terrified that she may linger for weeks or months in this state of not being able to swallow. Well, it didn't happen. So that was, that was a blessing. Um, and another case similar, um, I had another patient with hospice in Missoula who decided to, to end her life by stopping food and drink. And it, took, it was a process that took about a month. But both of, I, I bring up both of these because they're, both patients made this conscious choice for themselves. And we were there and just made it happen as comfortably as they could be and supported them in their decision and their family's decision. And it's not up to me as a hospice nurse to pass judgment, to say this is right or wrong. This was right for those patients and we, we helped them do that. So, I really feel that uh, that's an important thing working with with dying people is to just try to meet them where they are. Okay, wow. Um, 
Well, as Marika had said, I'm probably the I am the nurse with the least experience here because I came to nursing late in life. Um, but I was a doula and a, a labor and postpartum doula and a Lamas childbirth educator. So I already came from a more holistic approach to nursing and um, the thing that attracted me to hospice was about mind, body, and spirit nursing. Um, and I'll echo what you guys said, what hospice nurses know is um, everything to some and nothing to another person. Um, it changes every day. Um, my husband's back there, he can tell you, I come home and just say, wow, I can't believe what I did today or what I learned today. Um, for me, it's about a heart connection, whether you like the person or not. It's about a connection to that person. It's really taking a few minutes to look at that person and say, what do they need? What do they want? What do they desire? Um, I think it's really an amazing ability that we have at hospice to do things that otherwise we wouldn't be able to do, assist people with their dying wish to put their sailboat in the ocean and be able to help them do that, or to um, travel back east to have lobster. Um, and how do we manage that care for them? And how do we get them there? And how do we get them there safely and, and have enough energy to enjoy these things? Um, and it's about listening and observing and not imposing your own ideas. Um, I have so many stories that I've learned in my almost three years at hospice that I can't even begin to tell you. Um, <laughs> I don't think anybody can. The amazing stories that we have and what we see. and. Um, and whether you believe it or not, or you question it, it's always good to question things, right? When you see that and you go, hmm, wow, I never expected that. Or um, um, I can't believe the person thought this, and yet here they are doing this thing. I don't know. It's hard to explain. Um, I do know that not everybody dies peaceful and happy which is what we all want. And I know when I first started, I was, oh my God, I gotta make everybody forgive everybody and have this, you know, wonderful like death experience for this person. And that was my goal. I was gonna make everybody die just a wonderful death. And you know, the truth is it just doesn't happen. People die angry. People don't want to die, um, especially the young people with cancer. You know, they often say, I don't want to die, I'm not ready. I don't want to do this. And they die upset and angry at the world. And there's nothing we can do about that but support them where they are. Um, and as far as, uh, you know, if you guys, you probably know this, but you know, people can hear you through the dying process. It's the last sense to go. So what we do know is that people can hear us and what we say and how we can make them feel. And um, I've often told people, you know, the hearing is the last to go and we'll be whispering in your ear the whole time and tell you what's going on. And sometimes I've seen relief on people's faces who are dying when their loved one is up there whispering in their ear, you know, because they can hear. Um, I guess the new studies are out saying that the auditory nerve actually works 30 to 40 seconds after a person passes. So when a heart stops, people can actually still hear you. But if you think about it, wow, that's a pretty incredible thing. Um, I don't know. I did. It's, a, it's an amazing journey every single day. Yes, I get stressed. 
yes, I want to go home and throw my cell phone in the Clark Fork River. Um, <laughs> um, yes, it's incredibly rewarding. Um, do I have trouble with boundaries? Sometimes, um, although I think it's really important. Um, because you are there to guide. You don't want to be an intrinsic, for me personally, I don't want to be an intrinsic part of that family because I'm not their family. I want to let them be their family and to be on the outside holding them and guide them in that. Um, and sometimes people mistake that, you know, and so you have to be clear sometimes or else you would be in a big puddle on the floor every single night. Um, so I think it's about, it's about heart and connection and being able to find that balance where you can step in and where you can step out and where people need things and where you can back off and let the family figure that thing out. As far as one of my f m memorable stories, um, I guess Nancy, do you want the bunny story? That's one of Nancy's. I don't know. <laughs> We had a woman who was actually in her 90s and um, had been very sad and very depressed since her husband had died four years earlier. And her, she was starting on her journey. She wasn't eating or drinking and she was minimally responsive and her vital signs were just her blood pressure was very low and her heart rate was very high. And she laid in that state for four days. and. Um, I was there every day, and I was with the granddaughter, and the granddaughter just was looking at me. I've told her she can go. <laughs> She's fine to go. Go be with, you know, Grandpa. We love you. You've had an amazing life. You've taught us so much. And she just looked at me, and she said, Janie, why is she hanging on? And I said, I don't know. Obviously, there's something still keeping her here. She's still working through something. And I remember we went to reposition her, and she had a life large life-size bunny that they had tucked behind her back. She was on her side. And I pulled out the bunny and I said, oh, I've never seen this bunny really. What's this bunny for? And the granddaughter got this look on her face. She went, oh, grandma used to hold that bunny when her husband died because she said she didn't feel alone anymore in bed. So for Almost four years she's been holding that bunny at night. So we took that bunny and put that bunny in her arms and she died two minutes later. It's pretty incredible. Now, would she have died two minutes later had we not put the bunny in her arms? I don't know. And I'll never get to her. You know, I don't know. Well, it wasn't as attractive a poster to say what hospice nurses don't know. So what I do know, it is about compassion. It is about connection. Um, it's about listening, but not only listening with your ears, it's listening with your being and being present, 100% present. And that's hard to do. And that's why hospice nurses have a very high rate of um, leaving hospice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think when you say, uh, when you tell those stories that have duplicity, right? Some people don't want to die at all. And some people are like, well, I haven't I have died yet. Like, I'm ready for this. Like, bring right. it on. And you know, you're like, I don't know. You know, there's no way of knowing. You know, that's, I think, such an interesting piece. That's well, the number one question yeah. that I'm asked as a nurse by family, typically, yeah. um, is when, you know, especially if it's been a long vigil, like a four-day vigil of non-responsiveness with, uh, you know, all the vital signs indicating that death is imminent and, you know, family... Um, and, and it happens, and this is real, you know? It's hard to do a vigil that long. And, and people, it's, it's really, really, it's really challenging to maintain that. And it, it's draining and exhausting. And then they feel guilty by asking, when is it going to happen, you know? <laughs> and um, 
And I don't know. I don't, I, I, that's something I don't know as a nurse for hospice. And I have to say, I don't know a lot. And, but what I can say is, in terms of the afterlife question, because we get that asked that a lot yeah. too. And, or do they feel pain? Or can they, you know, I don't really know. I, I can't say for sure. We can tell you what we're observing. But this is what I, this is what I believe. This is what I think. What do you think your loved one thought? Or what do you believe happens? Um, but I say I don't know a lot. I don't know. And people know if you give family members not all family members, but if you give them space to sit and think and reflect and look at their loved one, you know, sometimes I'll turn the question back on them. Janie, when do you think they're going to die? And I'll say, well, let's sit for a second. When do you think they're going to die? What, what are you feeling? Trying to get them in touch. And often, you know what? Family members are right. You know? I had a gentleman who was battling long and hard with cancer. He was in his 50s. And the wife asked me that, and I turned the question on her. And she, we sat down, and I gave her a few minutes, and she said, I think he's going to die within the month. I said, you may be right. And he died three weeks later. So I think family members do know. They don't, but they don't, they either don't want to be in touch with that, or they're afraid to be in touch with that. And if we can al allow that with the family members and give them, and hold their hands while they're thinking that, it gives them a lot of confidence to be able to handle that person's death better. That's what I believe. Well, Kate, you're like the last on the totem pole here. <laughs> well, it's been a long time. I, I think the greatest gift that the years of hospice have given me is the the gift of the practice of being present. And whereas I think I too had boundaries in the beginning, uh, boundary problems in the beginning, the gift of learning real presence is what overcame the problem of boundaries. Because what patients and their families want from me as a nurse is presence at that moment. They aren't asking me to take it home with me. They aren't asking me to sleep with it. They aren't asking me to take it with my family. They aren't asking me to do all of those things that would burn me out and make it hard for me. They're only asking that at that moment that I'm with them, that I'm actually truly present. And when I got it, it smoothed out for me a lot. I was able to, to have fewer boundary problems, although <coughs> you don't get to choose who you love in life. So, uh, you know, you say it, it's this way and then someone comes along and they just steal your heart mm -hmm. and you, you take it home with you and it seems like there's nothing you can do about that. So, I, it's not a foolproof, it's not a foolproof thing. Our chaplain, I wish he was here tonight, Greg Grallo. He, and you guys may know the answer to this, he, one of his teachers told him that if he is really present with a person, and if it's only three minutes, and he's really present, you don't take that person home with you. You have, you have done what you're there to do, and that is to be present. If you're there for 30 minutes and you're distracted and you're answering your text messages and people are calling you and, and you're not for some reason being able to be 100% present with that, you will take that home with you. And I wish he was here. He articulated, articulates it much better than I just did. That's um, good. From one of his teachers. Yeah. And I, I, I agree. Just I agree through, you know, just experience. That you know, seems to be pretty true. I. I have had some experiences that brought me to different beliefs, I think, in my life. When I started hospice, I was really an agnostic, thinking, uh, you know, when you die, you die. That's good. I'm fine with that. I don't expect any more from life. This life is good. I think you live your heaven or your hell right here. That's, that's all fine and good. And then I had a couple of patients. <laughs> and, uh, 
I had a patient when I was a home health aide in a in the hospice, and I I was the aide that came at night, and I was allowed to sleep. I slept in a bed that was next to her bed, and she had a bed uh, a bell that she rang when she wanted me to wake up, and I was sleeping in the bed by her, and I was sleeping, and I was having a dream that. I was in her bed and I was holding her and her head was in my arm and I woke up her by her ringing the bell and I came to her bedside and she said, what are you doing in my bed holding me like that? Wow. And it was, it was just uh, stunning to me, like, okay, some things happen that I can't explain now. Oh. That was the first thing that was in my life, like, I can't, I can't explain that. And I went home that day, and I took my nap in the afternoon, and I got up and I made uh, Dutch apple pie, my favorite pie. And I cut a piece for her to bring home back to Gladys. It was another night, and I came and I was getting a report from the other aide, and I was putting my piece of Dutch apple pie in the fridge for her, and, and I said to the other aide, I'm bringing Dutch apple pie for Gladys, and she said, I don't know why you bothered. She woke up from her nap and she asked me to go get her Dutch apple pie. <laughs> and it was like, okay, what is this kind of connection, you know, what is this kind of connection? And uh, she was a, one of those women who's tough. She was a smoker. She was dying of lung cancer. She was one of those people, I put the cigarette up to her mouth before she died. You know, it was, you know, she never said please or thank you to anybody but me because I just demanded it, you know, I'll put that cigarette up, but you're going to say thank you. <laughs> we just, but we just had that, there was just something there and it was the first real time in my life that I had that kind of gritty, soul to soul connection with another human being and, uh, and, and, uh, and it was just the beginning of something that made me believe that there was something more than just that's all there is to life. And then I was a hospice nurse and I I had patients at home and I was on a bike ride one day and one of my favorite patients who was a cowboy and we could never get him to take a bath. He was re like really a cowboy, a cowboy that only bathed in the springtime. <laughs> and we would, we would try to tease him and try to get him to believe it was springtime and bribe him with coffee and nothing, we couldn't get him to take a bath. And, and so I was on a bike ride and I thought I'll just stop by and just see him. It was another one of those people, you know, kind of tough and gritty and you just can't help but love them. And, and I stopped by and he was dying, kind of like out of the blue. I, you know, you'll hear these stories from hospice nurses will say like, out of the blue, they were dying. And people say, hey, they were on hospice, what were you, what were you expecting? But no, we in hospice, there's a time when we expect them to die and sometimes, sometimes we're not expecting them to die. You may think that yes, they're on hospice. You expect them, but we're, we're we have a timeline uh, there somehow in our minds. So he he was dying, and he was lying there, and he was had his arms up, and he was saying orange, orange, and I brought him an orange, an orange juice, an orange color, an orange of every kind, every imaginable orange I could think of. For, it was like an hour and a half and then he died. And I, I called his sister and she came and and I said, I don't know what was going on. <coughs> he was putting his arms up and calling orange and I'd hold him and I brought him orange juice and he said, she said, his brother was orange. His brother's name was orange. Mm -hmm. And and then I started to believe, okay, there's something else. Yeah. There's something else. You know, the medical community says to us clinically, oh, come on, there's a lack of oxygen to the brain, and people starting to see things that, you know. But I'm there. We're there. And if it was just a lack of oxygen to the brain, you would see all kinds of things. But what we see is it's people who have died before them, mm -hmm. and it's generally people they know. Mm -hmm. And if it was just lack of oxygen to the brain, you would see all kinds of things, and that's not what we see. That's not what we hear. I, I honestly almost quit about three weeks ago. Not really, but <laughs> <laughs> I quit. <laughs> I'm teasing. 
No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But I called my director of nursing and I said, I think it may be time for me to leave. And he said, what happened? And I was seeing a patient in the hospital. And um, in the hospital, he was dying. And his daughter was there. And his daughter and I kept talking about everything. And I was just saying, I don't know this man. First time I'm meeting him. And I see a cat out of the corner of my eye. And I actually went like this. Well, I know there's no cat in the hospital room. And I looked at her and I said, please don't think I'm weird. But does your dad have a cat? And she said, oh, his cat is his best friend. And she said, did you just see a ghost kitty? And I said, I did just see a ghost kitty. And he died. I mean, he died <laughs> with his cat there. And it was weird. Now, why would I know that? You know, why would I know that? Weird stuff happens. Weird stuff like that. And then I called Josh and said, I think maybe it might be time for me to get out of hospice and see ghost kitties. <laughs> yeah. Things happen that we can't explain. Right. But I, I think what keeps us in hospice, and people often say to us, oh, you're so special. Mm -hmm. I could never do that. And <laughs> it's because it isn't our brother, our father, our lover, our husband, it isn't time after time. It isn't that person to us. We couldn't do it if it was that person to us. Right. It is someone else. And that's how we can do it, time after time after time. But because we are good at system <coughs> management and we get to actually be there for this wonderful thing to say, yes, you are going. And now, between this moment and that moment, now what? Let's think about it. Let's talk about it. Let me be there with you. And let's see what's important to you and your family. And how do we make things happen between now and then? This is your time. And we're here to help make that happen. That's what's really, really rewarding in hospice, as a hospice nurse. That's what makes it exciting. That's what's what breathes life into us as hospice nurses, I think, when we get so good at symptom management that that really becomes the focal point of what we do in hospice. It's, it's just energizing. It's, it's fun, actually. I also think that, it, I don't think anyone would disagree, um, all the nurses here, that because we do this, we're not, it, it's taken kind of the fear away. You know, I don't feel afraid about dying. I don't feel I don't feel like death is a scary thing. And I don't even like to use the word death because I don't believe that it, I think it's a transition. It's it's moving into another kind of realm. So it, it's almost like an adventure in a way. And it sounds weird, but <laughs> and and so if we if but because of our experience and we see this happening to so many people, we can bring that kind of comfort to people who, you know, many of the people we, we serve are, this is the one and only time they're experiencing this in their whole lifetime. Their loved one is dying and they've never seen anyone die before. So if we can, if we can even bring that small thing to them that this isn't scary, that's a huge, mm -hmm. huge thing. And this is what you can expect. You know, right. you're afraid of the unknown. But we can tell you, with this disease, you can expect about this. I mean, everybody is a, a bit different. But you can expect about this sort of thing to happen. And, and it's not like in hospice care we don't do anything. Uh, oftentimes people think, oh, we take away their medicines and, and that's the end of it. And it isn't that. It's a very active, very proactive type of care where we absolutely make sure that we address the symptoms and the human. That's what's so missing in, in medicine today. We actually get to address the human being inside. And, and that's, I mean, that's the beauty in what we do. It's why we got into probably nursing in the first place. Yeah. We really loved being there for the human being. So I wonder if anyone has questions that you would like to ask. Yeah, there's one back there. A little. Uh, 
Um, you mentioned that um, one person, or maybe several people, decided to stop eating and drinking. And I've always been under the impression that as part of a, um, a death process that it isn't so much a decision as it is the body basically shuts down and does not want food or drink. And in some institutions, they actually still insist on feeding you or inline feeding you or something. I'm wondering if the person who decides to stop eating and drinking, do they often all of a sudden say, I want to drink of water, get parched? I mean, because it well, seem like the particular patient I was speaking of um, you're right, most, most people whose diseases play out to, the, to finality lose the ability or the desire. First they lose the desire to eat and drink as their body's shutting down. That's very normal, but this person had, had a disease, she was diagnosed with a disease that may have had years ahead of her, years of something she didn't want to face. So she chose at that point, where she was still very active and e able to eat and drink, to, she chose to stop. And she was able to carry that out all the way to She did. It was her, her choice. And she did, um, she stopped eating, and she continued to take ice chips for two or three weeks because she had um, things she wanted to do. She had wanted to write letters to people and she wanted to finalize paperwork and write memoirs. And once she finished her paperwork, then she stopped the ice chips. And then once that happened, it was only a matter of probably less than a week. But she, because she had made this decision, um, by the time she stopped the ice chips, she also chewed a lot of gum. I was just going to say that. I was like, and She chewed gum, gum all the time. But once she, she had stopped eating for a good three weeks prior. So she'd gotten very weak. So she was basically bed bound when she started, stopped the ice chips and then she kind of just, and we, we had medic medications for her to be comfortable. She, you know, she had help with, with being comfortable with medications. Is it dehydration and, that finally would cause death? Um, yeah. If you didn't have ice chips, you yeah. could make yourself say, I'm not going to have anything even though I'm parched and I want some. Didn't medication. she have she, signs up at her house? She did. She had, she put signs out on all the walls to remind her. This was, she did that before, you know, at the beginning. And we, and when I say we brought in medications, we did, but we also brought in massage therapy and you know, we had music, we had spiritual care. I mean, it was like, it was a team approach. It wasn't just physical. We addressed her, like Kit said, the whole person, the mind, body, spirit, and as a team, that's what we do. Hospice isn't a one-man show, or one-woman show. It's not, it's, yeah, absolutely not. We couldn't do it without our team. Yeah, the, the one, the other thing about the team is I think we all kind of overlap because we're all approaching the patient as a whole, in a holistic way. So the social, social worker's um, aware when the patient's having a physical symptom mm -hmm. and calls the nurse. Or the nurse is aware when there's a, a spiritual crisis and calls the chaplain or whatever. We, we all, we're all aware of what's going on. So we work, that's the beauty of the team approach. And, my question was just mainly, can a person actually, very few people can probably actually make the decision and carry it all the way out that no, I am not going to have any liquid in my body. I quit this, two weeks ago. This was a, a, a phenomenally strong woman. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's, it's getting, mm -hmm. it, um, um, actually the, the last um, uh, journal of hospice and palliative care nursing that came out, has an article in it on um, patients who are, and, and the fact that it's getting to be um, a, quite a big population that is choosing to forgo food and fluids as a mechanism to reach the end of life. So, yeah. Well, and, and I think it seems to me just by observation that once, you, once you've reached a certain point, um, you lose that that desire, like you do, you, you lose it, and actually to ingest something, 
creates physical discomfort. Um, and so, even water. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. A absolutely. Yes. And while you know, you know, certainly at, at the very end of life, when somebody is has truly lost their ability to swallow, and so they haven't eaten or drank anything for quite some time, to put water in them causes a whole lot of distress. Now, typically there are a whole lots of mouth breathing and dry mucosa, and so we do provide a lot of oral care to make sure that you know, we take care of the phlegm accumulation, which can cause the rattle that you hear at the end of life, which is so disconcerting for so many people. While it's not typically something that creates discomfort in that dying person, it's hard for family members to hear, and so we try to help minimize that audible sound, but it's not entirely uncomfortable for the person. They have no distress signs whatsoever with that. But to trickle water in there, to pour water in there, will elicit a cough response or you know choking um, mm -hmm. that does not appear to be comfortable whatsoever. And so there's lots of coaching and education in that regard, constant, constant. Because as care caregivers, you know, and fam I mean, people want to nurture by giving food and water. It's really, really hard to give that up. It's a huge problem, and that that takes up a great deal of my time sometimes as a hospice nurse in terms of providing that education and reassurance, the ongoing reassurance that this is okay, that we're not attempting to feed or water a person anymore because it's really only going to provide discomfort and distress. The organs can't take it, the body can't take it, and at some point all of us are going to die. We're all going to be there unless we have a sudden event. And that's what the body does, as it shuts down, it can no longer process that. And um, But as as family and loved ones, we don't want to, it's hard. It takes a lot of education, reassurance, reassurance, reassurance. And you know, for me, 10 times out of 10, these people, people who are having the hardest time starving their loved ones come around and say, oh, we can't. You know, I, I can't believe I was so resistant to that because now I get it, you know. But it's, that's a hard one. It's really, really tough. There's a really good article this morning, actually, in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I actually printed it off, but it's called Food and the Dying Patient. It's written mm -hmm. by a physician. Mm -hmm. And I'll share it on our Facebook page if anybody wants to go and read it, or you yeah. can just look it up on the New York Times. Mm -hmm. but, it's short and to the point, but it talks about exactly that. Mm -hmm. you know? And I, when I talk to my patients about it and their family members, I like to use the analogy. I think one of my nurses that I used to work with um, used this with me, or, or might have been one of the doctors, but um, used the broken down car analogy, and I've always stuck with that. But you know, looking at food as, as gasoline, really, and, you know, a dying patient's body kind of as a car that's broken down. You know, you can put as much gas into that car as you want. It's not going to make that car work. So the body is, it's a, food is a staple, and there's two main staples to living. Food, you know, food and water and, and breathing. And the body knows naturally that it has to remove those staples in order for its, its spirit for life to end. So it will do that. And whether we want it to or not, it will find a way to. So a lot of family members, it's probably the single hardest thing to do that our families struggle with is, especially in American culture, we eat when we're sad, and we eat when we're happy, and we eat when we're party. And if somebody stops eating, there's something wrong. So we'll force feed people, and what happens when we force feed somebody that doesn't feel good, then they choke on that. And when they choke on the food, or and they don't want to eat it, then it doesn't go down into their stomach. The only other tube there is their, you know, their, their lungs. So then you've got pneumonia on your hands and a lot more trouble and negative symptoms. So it's important to be able to help people understand that it's okay. 
There's also something really with like going fearful of feeling like you're the star to that. And oh, sure. it feels yeah. like okay. there are the medical community, especially if you're based out of lawsuits, saying, well, we can't right. let them start to death. And when families hear that, it becomes really scary for them by saying, like, somehow they have the power to starve them to death, as opposed to letting the body naturally pass away. And um, it's a big struggle. Of, like, are they really starving to death, or are they dying naturally of the stroke that prevents them from swallowing anymore? You know, it's like, who's in control here? The brain and the stroke that makes it not possible to swallow, or the fact that we can't put the medical, we choose not to put the medical intervention that just means they're going to you know, sustain off of someone doing that for them. But they've already said in their advance directive they don't want. Which brings up advanced directives to say, mm -hmm. and like I've said, don't ever put a spoon to my mouth, no matter what happens. No spoon to my mouth, no feeding to. Eat if it's ice cream. Never. No, nothing. <laughs> if I can't do this, don't do it to me. Yeah. Because then let nature take its course. Mm -hmm. I'm good to go. Then, then fam my family doesn't have to make that decision. So it's interesting, Mindy, you're talking about food and nutrition because you know we all feel like that's a huge, a huge barrier at end of life, and a huge amount of teaching. And um, I'm, I'm going to ask for some ideas because I don't think you can just say stop eating and drinking or feeding and, and giving them water. So it's a matter of <coughs> giving them alternatives of comfort. So. Because you can't just take that away. You just need no. something to fill Oh, no, no absolutely no, not. So I'm just asking, you know, so we have things about, you know, mouth care, which is always the swabbing was, is brilliant. It's, you know, rubbing their hands, telling them stories. But do, do you have other things that that you guys... We like? don't deny it. We always offer food. Yeah. Always. Yeah, yeah. It's not the no, no, no. Say, oh, I, I wasn't saying. Happen. I wasn't saying that, Kit. Yeah. Because as a, a social worker, I'm always looking for other ways of nurturing. And I'm wondering, besides music and the normal ones, have you guys come up with any other things to to say to patients and their families? Why don't you try this? Because I'm always looking for other ideas. I think it depends on what, at what stage this conversation right. is occurring with somebody. You know, if you have somebody who has profound dementia but is still even ambulatory but has no interest in food whatsoever, um, or, you know, of course we offer, 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 you know, give them whatever they like and, right. and, and dispel the, the idea they have to have a balanced diet or, you know, talk about the taste buds, you know, with the sweet taste being the last to remain and that's why people want to eat ice cream fine ha they can eat ice cream all they want but you know if, it, if it's to a point where somebody is non-responsive and, and this you know in that active dying phase um, it, it kind of depends because sometimes doing a lot of touch Hurts. can be very um, distressing to people mm -hmm. my, my biggest thing especially if you have a, a, a group of family together is to encourage them to love each other, reminisce, mm -hmm. laugh. Let, let that person hear you laugh and talk yeah. about how you were raised, if it's a family. Or um, what, what funny stories about you know, things that have pa happened in the past. And that's what I typically. Okay. And singing. Things that are of a rote memory, mm -hmm. like happy birthday. Nobody ever sang happy birthday to you when it wasn't a great time. Mm -hmm. So happy birthday and, uh, you know, row, row, row your boat. Things that you sing, learned sing. as a child that are in your rote memory that could, you know, just bring up something happy. I've, I've had patients who didn't say a word for years that I sing happy birthday and they start to sing. Mm -hmm. So sometimes mm -hmm. that helps, you know, just bring, bring it up again. I think, I think something that we've been finding more and more effective, too, is bringing it up at the first meeting, at the informational or at the, at the admit, where we talk about what to expect and what our care looks like and what our philosophy is at Hospice of Missoula. And we talk about, you know, there might come a time where um, your loved one doesn't want to eat anymore and that'll be hard and we want to just give you a little information now to prepare for that. 
And so what might provide comfort is a big stuffed bunny that we have no idea. And the family doesn't know. But if we plant those seeds early and we say, so be thinking about what's really great in your family and what's comfortable and loving and what, how you guys, what's your language? Be thinking about that so that you're prepared when that time comes and, and this person doesn't want to eat anymore. Or you might even think about when I'm feeling really edgy, I bring up, you might choose to stop feeding your puppy and, and convey what kid conveyed. What did they want? And when we have that conversation and it admit, sometimes you see this, she would never want to live this way. And it's it's a it's a permission and it's a like I never thought about that. And then we shared this patient who chose who chose very early to stop eating. And um, I knew her in her prime, and she was a person who fasted as a practice in her youth. So she had practiced for this already, and that's why she was able to do it because she was a person who fasted. So it's gotten us all thinking about, you know, it's more than this last six months of people being on hospice. We have to start now with our intention, and then we have to start at the advent when we're talking to people about what this care looks like. It might look like not feeding your loved one, and that doesn't sound like care, but there will come a time where it is. It's so much about whose standard. I think what, what you guys have so beautifully demonstrated without saying it, that what I know about hospice nurses and what hospice nurses know is how to be bold in advocating for what their hospice patients want, regardless of whose norms are surrounding the patients when they come to hospice. And I think you know what comes to mind is that you know patient that has been struggling and finally comes to hospice because she says, I can't do chemo anymore. I just can't. And we call her insurance and say, she can't do chemo anymore. She wants to come on. And they say, but she's still coming to work. How can she go on hospice if she's still coming to work? That doesn't make sense. And I'm like, you know, we talk about this. Mm -hmm. You know, we see the reports that say like, they said like 80% of people who die of cancer under the age of 60 have worked within 30 days of their passing. Mm -hmm. I was like, what do you mean hospice? I mean, even Medicare recognizes it for six months, even though all of us would say people should have that type of palliative care and love up to two years before they pass away is like a minimum standard of what we want. So um, I think what we know about hospice nurses and, and by proxy all of hospice staff is we're not afraid to say, you know, these norms that we've become used to saying, you know, your insurance standards say here's the what you're supposed to look like and how you're supposed to feel while you're going through this illness. Or, you know, even your religious standards say this is what you're supposed to feel like and that it's not okay to do this or your doctor that, you know, has gotten attached to you for 50 years because you've been together for that long and doesn't want to let you die either. You know, he's telling you to do this or not to do this, you know, but we can hear what you're saying and then we can go back and advocate for you. And I think that, you know, that's a real gift, but it does challenge a lot of things. It's hard. There's a question over here. You got a question? Yeah, I have two, actually. So, um, is it Jeannie? Jeannie. Jeannie. I, the Jane. And you? Amy. 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 So Amy, you said you were talking about two things I'd like to follow up on. Someone was talking about um, talking about forgiveness with the family. And I, I wondered if you could get get more specific about what words you use and how you gently encourage family to look at those things and talk to each other. And the other one is that you said there are patterns, certain patterns that happen, and I I'd like to hear more about those patterns. Okay. If you want to um, well, I forgiveness. Um, I, I think that if if you, as a nurse or any hospice team member, it doesn't have to be the nurse, um, notices. Like I said, we what we do is observe. We much of our job is an observation. So if we pick up on that, there is some kind of you know, forgiveness issue, something that needs to be worked out. Um, we, what we can do is, you can't, you can't be direct and say, oh, well, I think you have this problem, you know. Okay. It's, it's more of um, encouraging the people to think about it. Maybe we bring in a book 
or something to read, or maybe we just talk about, you know, talk about some, you know, well, I've observed this. Is this something that maybe you could use help with? I, I off, many times I will offer the my other team members, you know, the social worker or chaplain, or even music thanatologist. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, say, why don't we try, or, or even massage therapy sometimes can help people release or open up. So I don't, I'm not a, I don't think that I can just do all this by myself. <laughs> um, you know, so I'll, I'll kind of gently try to facilitate what, you know, as a case manager, the nurse is the case manager, so we're, we're kind of the person who coordinates the rest of the team, so um, we're kind of responsible for making those phone calls or those contacts, um, you know, to get whatever assistance we need to do. Sometimes we go outside of hospice, you know, we can make, we can make referrals to, you know, outside sources as well. That's okay. Um, as for patterns, I think what part of, part of the patterns that we kind of notice physical patterns are um, getting weaker, eating less and less and less, eating and drinking less, getting more and more fatigued, sleeping more and more and more. It's, it's kind of like I tell a lot of people, you know how when you're born and you're a baby, you sleep all day and you sleep less and less and less as you grow into toddlerhood and then childhood. Well, this is sort of the reverse. It starts with one nap. Don't ever start. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it, you sleep more and more and more. That's one pattern. Um, and the eating and drinking is a pattern. And another pattern we notice is um, noticing, I mean, it's very, very obvious. And it happens with, I would say, not all, but most people. We notice them either looking off into the corner or a part of the room. Mm -hmm talking to someone who's not there, calling out names of people that are deceased, they might they might turn they might turn to you and say, you know, why is my husband over in that chair? You know, they're confused. Um, the reaching, reaching up, um, picking at clothing mm -hmm. and bed covers. Um, there are just certain patterns that we notice. Another pattern that happens to many, many people is they, they reach a point where they're almost comatose. And you think, okay, we're at the end here. And suddenly, they have a burst of energy. And they want to go. And they're up. And they might have a day or two where they're up and eating again. And they want to go talk and laugh and play cards or whatever. Go somewhere. Go. Go. I want and, to go. And, and then they, yes. then we call that a, la a rally. Um, another thing that happens, pattern that we see, or there's this metaphoric talking about travel. So you might be a plane mm -hmm. trip or a train trip or a bus trip or a ship. I will need to pack my bag. I need to, the, my tickets. I'm, I, I have to go. I'm, I need to go home. I need to go home. Well, you are home. No, I need to go home. Mm -hmm. well, They're not talking about their physical house, you know. And some people have said, so. oh, the bus just went. I didn't get on it. And you go, okay, okay. they're not ready. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of that talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's also what I've noticed, and you guys can chime in, of course, is I see a drawing inward as people are starting That's true. their journey. They stop. Mm, they want to spend more time alone, maybe. They don't want to participate as much in television. They lose interest in what they loved. And it, they, it's just like, it's hard to explain, but it's just sort of like a coming in. We always just we always have that sort of joke about the rally because somebody will be pretty imminent, we'll think, like about to die, and then they'll have ice cream or mm -hmm. a hamburger, like something. We're yeah. Like, oh, it was ice cream. Like everyone should have that. A hamburger, French fries, and a chocolate shake. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, ama never, it's amazing. No. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm curious if you could just talk about the. I know it's not a moment. Because I was with my mom as she died, and I was with her that moment. And she did sit up, and her eyes flew open, and then she was completely relaxed. What else happens at the moment? 
And I know that you're not just dead. There's still it's, a lot of metabolic so, processing and cellular so stuff it's, happening. Do some people just, I mean, what else happens? They're split up, eyes open, and then. That happens to some people, and some people just fade. They just, mm -hmm. they some people just, just go to sleep. They just go to sleep, and they, their, their breathing gets slower and slower and farther apart mm -hmm. until it stops. That's it. And others, that happened to my uncle. I was with my uncle when he died, and he, he was comatose for a day, and at the, at the moment of death, he went like this, opened his eyes wide, and went like that, and smiled, and then and he just clear. Died. And it was so amazing. He looked so happy, you know? And it, he had been totally comatose for a day before that happened. And then certain diseases, you will see things too, you know? And one thing is kidney failure. People just tend to go to sleep mm -hmm. and not wake up. So you do see little patterns like that, but it is not set. No. It is not set. Patterns, but I think not one death is No. Death is as You missed out on this teaching oh. so, yeah. <laughs> We talked about that. things that we can say for an individual that may or may not occur, that we've seen it before in this kind of situation, but that it's not always the same pattern, um, you know, and, you know, that, that to have a person be very cloudy-eyed, glazed for more than a day, very much in a non-responsive coma-like state at the end of life, take a breath and open their eyes and be clear-eyed, it's, it's profound, mm -hmm. that's all I can say. But it doesn't happen all the time. I think, I think when we start, when we meet a family and, and, and begin care, we, we bring in something called the comfort pack, which is a little bag full of several different medications for various symptoms. And, we usually go through those medications with the patient and the family, and we explain to them that you may need all of these or you may need none of these, but they're here if you need them. And we kind of, we kind of go through what those symptoms could look like, but many people never have any of them. Mm -hmm. And some people have them all and, or all anything in between. <laughs> yeah. So we, what we want to be is prepared, but just because some people have a death rattle doesn't mean it's going to happen. You know, or some people, you know, have pain, physical pain, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. And some people have great anxiety, while others are so ready and want to die, they, they're just totally they melt into it. You know, it's, it's very, very individual. And you hear stories where people say, oh, you know, they hung on until their uncle and their sons and brothers and everybody came. But after all these years of hospice nursing, I can tell you that there were just as many stories where they didn't hang on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the stories where they did hang on are such much better stories. <laughs> those are the ones that are on. Those yeah. are the stories that really get going. And so, and so that's what kind of lives, lives on is that people can do that. But as a hospice nurse, I'd have to say there are just as many that don't. So right, right. I wouldn't, so, I wouldn't make that as, as that's, that people can. Because I, I don't, I don't know if people can. I, I usually try to say to people, what, what was this person like in their life? Were they private, a private person? You know, if they are, they might want to die alone. Mm -hmm. You know, some people wait for everyone right. to leave. Yep, that happens a lot. Yeah, I think I'd be on that one too. Yeah, yeah. And some people want to be surrounded. surrounded. Well, did we answer your question? Do you have? No, that's great. Thanks. Okay. Well, I don't know, Nancy. Can I follow up with you about the forgiveness issue? <laughs> I just out, sorry. Oh. Um, so, so when you when you sense that the family needs to talk about forgiveness, how do you help make that happen? I don't ever sense. I put it out there for everybody. I think it's probably universal. <laughs> Again, you know, and this is all like learning as I go. I think we're all just practicing. Practicing. <laughs> yeah, and. Um, my social work training trained me that my client is the expert and I'm a learner. So um, that is always my approach. And, and uh, so it's like, what do you know about yourself and help me learn what I need to know to help you? 
And so maybe at the informational, depending on readiness, some people are just so shell-shocked that they're discussing hospice. We don't go there then, but really early, in earliest possible, somebody on the team and our other, one of our other social workers, Mary Place, has a great line, tag your in, because you don't know. Could be the nurse, could be the social worker, could be the chaplain, could be the nurse's aide, who finds that opening to say, you know, some of the things that we encourage people to think about, and we make it really general so they don't think we're, we, we saw a dynamic. <laughs> but now you're all going to know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we all think that, you know, forgiveness, and love and gratitude are three really key concepts in every life process. And so we want to just remind you to consider those. Like you might want to, you might feel bad about something from way back, and this is the time to just generally say, I feel bad about some stuff, Mom, and I'm really sorry. And you can just, just say it as easy as that. Or you can get really, really specific. You follow, you're the expert on you. So we just put it out there in a very general way so people don't feel judged, so they don't think, oh man, they saw me snap at my mom and I don't ever yell at my mom, but today I did because you know everything's going crazy and so they think I'm feeling guilty. We just put it out there for everybody and I, I do in a very general like, well, here's some more stuff we're gonna throw at you for you to just chew on. And if you wanna talk about it with one of us, we're all here, and you can pick who you want to talk about it with. Um, and I think that's why I like Hospice of Missoula, is we're, we're all very overlappy and respectful of the specific expertise. So here he said, I know just enough nursing to be dangerous, so let me write your question down and have your nurse give you a call. <laughs> but, you know, we all just kind of try to pay attention. Um, and I think we, you know, refer to Adam Biog's book, The Five Things That Matter Most, oftentimes, and say, you know, it's a good book. Here are five things, you know. Yeah. We borrow it from him. He borrowed it from us. I think it's all fair, you know. <laughs> and and it does kind of just give you an overview, and and it doesn't pinpoint anybody. So, but there are five things that are really pretty important to him. Mm -hmm. You know, in my experience, I think. Um, most of the time, things just fall in, really fall into place at this time of life. And what, what our job is really in the family is to facilitate learning and really to guide the family in, in the, the direction that they need to be to help that patient be the most comfortable that they can be. And if that means that there's a son that's been removed or a daughter that is you know, uh, hasn't seen that person for years and years, then really what we can say is there might be some some need there. You know, there might be some unfinished business. And whether or not that means having myself reach out to that person <clears throat> or our social worker just make them a you know, telephone call and say, you know, your mom is, is dying and we understand that you haven't made contact and there might be some rough ground here. Or maybe the rift is not between mom and, and son, but maybe between brother and sister. And this is really a time to come to the bedside and maybe just, you don't have to make amends, but you might want to see this person one more time. If you can get them back in the home, the family does their own damage control. You don't have to do anything else. We encourage life review, and if you can get them to never even mention the damage that was done, whatever caused their rift in the first place, if they can start thinking about the good times, which they will do, they'll do it on their own because their loved one is dying. They, most of the time, they'll make up. Whether or not that stays afterwards, or not, you know, not all the time it does, but we've seen it happen. I've seen it happen more often than not. Where they will. I just wanted to speak very briefly to that it is a process, and I think, I'm just gonna out you, Cindy was my mom's hospice nurse, and the hospice of Missoula took care of my mom as she died. And you did a beautiful job of saying, we could do that, we could try that. You really gave us control, because brother number one in Missoula said, well, let's take away the anti-agitation and morphine so that she's awake when brother from Texas gets here. And we were like, oh, sure, we could do that. And I, and I was like, no! But you let 
him realize on his own why that's not a good idea. And then brother from Texas is going to get here, and well, let's, you know, she got there, and why don't we have oxygen on her? She, wouldn't she be more comfortable? And you were like, absolutely. Well, yes, you know, you let us have ideas of what we ought to do. And you didn't say, no, don't do that, because it just prolongs the dying process. And blah, blah, blah. You didn't tell us what to do. You agreed, yes, we could put an oxygen mask on. Yes, we can let her come out of morphine and anti-agitation drugs. To, to, and she knew my brother was there, and she would not have wanted to prolong dying by being more comfortable for five more days. So letting us problem solve just what you said. Put it out there, nudge it around, throw it, lob it back into the middle of the room with the bed in it, and let us <laughs> And you And you give a lot of choice. Well, we could, you know, we could put oxygen on, and here's scenario A, and here's scenario B, and here's scenario C, and I'll do whatever you want. But I really love yeah. that you. There was always the we, and we don't know, and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. And there was never a, okay, this this will happen if we do this. There was always the journey process approach. Mm -hmm. Always the journey process approach, which I appreciate a lot. And then, you know, you had the most beautiful in-home memorial for your mom, and she was absolutely gorgeous mm -hmm. at home. Eat, despite the funeral home saying, what? We're going to, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> So I have she, the privilege of sharing my story in full next month, if you care to hear it and see yeah, cool. some pictures of my fabulous mother. Yeah, it, yeah and it was. And the, the like, yeah, Beautiful. hospice, I love hospice <laughs> as well. And hospice in general, I and mean, not just you guys, but the work that you do and the service you provide to society is immeasurable. I just want to say thank you. I, um, as a practitioner, you, it, this was like the church of the hospice nurses. <laughs> it really, it just inspired me again because we get involved in the business of hospice and the transferring and the rest of care and the VA. And <laughs> you just reminded me again, you guys are fantastic about listening and learning and just being present how important that part is. So thank you so much. Really, it's great. Thanks, Claire. I was just trying to find, there is a poem, and our chaplain um, has issued this in print to us, and it is called Life is Unfinished Business. It's really poignant. It's short, and maybe we can put that on the website, too, for you guys all to read. I'm just a good reminder. Yeah. Just a good reminder. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I have a lot of gratitude to all of you being here too because it takes a lot to be vulnerable with us you know to be vulnerable in your own stories even though uh, I mean a spirit cat really like that's a vulnerable thing to admit to say like, I've seen crazy things and I don't know if they're I don't know what happened and I'm still a same person and I still practice and like that's a vulnerable place to be for all of you so thank you for coming they're all available at 543 Thank you for being here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.